Okay, thank you very much, Bruce. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, as, as Bruce said, we're a bit run a bit tight at time, so it's going to be a bit of a race through. Well, a bit of a race through some things. Okay, let's say we have two sites. One with a few images that are missing lots. Another site where all of the text is slightly artistic, so it's a little bit down in contrast. Neither of these sites are going to present any real problems for most web users, okay? I wouldn't find a problem, a couple of missing holes and a little bit down on it. <coughs> so which is the least accessible? <coughs> which is the likeliest to cause problems to some users? Which developer do we send to the guillotine to continue with the French Revolution theme? This is the people's court, okay? So I'm going to get a vote from you guys, right? You've got a vote. So do we send the, the developer with a few missing ops to the guillotine? Who's for that? Okay. Do we send the artistic slightly um, out of spec colour contrast to the guillotine? Geez, the rest of you have been hopeless in the French Revolution. You didn't have to lose your heads. You've got, to, you've got to take sides on this. Okay. Let's just consider those two examples for a moment from the point of view of users. But, you know, for somebody who relies on a screen reader, a couple of missing holes can be either a really major problem or it can be very minor, depending on what the holes are missing from. Obviously, holes also apply to some not only blind people, but also to people who turn images off by choice. Like, for example, people who live in regional rural Australia who turn them off to increase uh, the speed of which they download. They're going to be mighty pissed off if uh, they've turned their images on just to find there's a picture of you know, your aunt Bob or your uncle Mary or whatever. So they might not like a few missing odds. Screen magnifier users, a couple of missing odds won't make any difference at all to them, but colour contrast could quite well make a difference to them because quite often screen magnifier users just have a colour vision. Um, and then there's also people who with impaired colour vision, and that includes a large proportion of people over the age of 60, which we have found from our research. Insufficient colour contrast for them could render the pages totally inaccessible, if as in our example, it was the text. Accessibility at the end of the day is really about users. And whether a site is accessible or not depends on a couple of factors. It depends on really three factors that we need to balance. First, there are the personal barriers to access that the individual might have. Now, they might be technological barriers, environmental barriers. It could be a physical disability that requires you to reuse an assistive device. It could be a cognitive learning or language disability that means you just can't comprehend the, uh, the content of the page. Then we obviously next have to consider the actual quality of the code, which is what you know, most of you people are interested in. You know. Is the code going to be accessible? Is the content going to be accessible? We also have to consider the ability of user agents, such as browsers and screen readers, to render that code in a way that can be perceived. And finally, which is often overlooked, we have to also be mindful of the ability of the user to use those agents. It's often wrongly assumed that all people who use browsers and Operating systems know how to do those things, how to make the font size bigger, how to change the high contrast mode. They don't. It's also often wrongly assumed that all users of assistive technologies, like a screen reader, are experts in their technology. They're not. They're just like everybody else. Some are very good, some just basically muddle through, like most people do with Microsoft Word. Now, working out of the pages is likely to cause an accessibility problem, it's, it's not rocket science. But then again, it's not a piece of cake either. With a bit of knowledge and a few tools, it's pretty easy to get an idea of whether or not a site, not a site is going to comply with Web Content Guidelines version 2, or Week 8 2, as we call it. However, determining whether those accessibility problems, the likely implication of those accessibility problems and what you can do about it, is a little more complicated and takes a bit more experience. Quite possible, some of you, I imagine, have worked on sites which have been condemned, someone's roundly condemned and immediately because they've been somebody been employed to review the site or you've run into someone on the street. 
And yeah, you missed a couple of dollars, and it's been roundly condemned, it's been totally inaccessible. How did anybody do that? There's such a dog of a sight. The headings aren't properly nested, there's two missing holes, they wouldn't go off to the guillotine. Or it's also, at the other extreme, I've had people come up to me and absolutely declare without it, any doubt at all, my site is 100% accessible because one person has tested it with one version of one screen reader and they had no problems doing what they wanted to do. Now, that's, if you like, at the two extremes, but I come across those experiences all the time. There's been much discussion and some argument, unfortunately, about how to determine the accessibility of websites. And often this is polarised around two kinds of points of view. On the one hand, we have this notion of compliance checking, conformance checking against a series of a checklist, against the predetermined criteria. And on the other hand, we have the only way to tell if a site is accessible is by getting people with disabilities to test it and to use it. Both approaches have their strengths and limitations. Neither approach alone can give you an absolutely reliable declaration of the accessibility of a site. And ideally, any really thorough evaluation of a website should involve both approaches. But just the real world, time, money, clients don't have much of those, means that this very rarely happens. So, most often, accessibility evaluations are determined by just taking the first option, which is a compliance review. So I just thought I might quickly run through a couple of the pluses and minuses relating to compliance reviews and bounce a few of those off against user testing for a second. As I said, it's the most common way of reviewing the accessibility of site compliance reviews against a predetermined checklist. In Australia, it's web point guidelines version 2. The great advantages are you're able to identify a wide, diverse range of accessibility issues. Something that's harder to do if you're just doing user testing because then you can only really identify the issues that the people with the disabilities that you're testing with have. If they have, for example, if you're testing with someone who is blind, you'll pick up all the issues that might be great someone who is blind, but not issues that might relate to someone who is colorblind, for example. Another really big advantage is that it's easy to incorporate at different stages in the production process and increasingly that's what clients do is they take a very iterative design and check in accessibility all the time as they go through. And it's relatively speaking when compared to user testing quick and inexpensive to do. The negatives is it depends on the checklist, so the quality of the checklist in terms of the quick A2 the checklists are pretty good. A really big negative is it tends to reduce accessibility just down to that checklist. Checking off a series of checkpoints. If you like all the checkpoints, I'm fine. It doesn't really think about the user, the likely impact on the user. And obviously another real disadvantage is it doesn't involve real people doing real tasks in real time. So in order to help illustrate some of the complexity of some of these things, I prepared this very simple, innocuous looking form up here. It's got a few problems, we'll see. The form has just five text input fields. Very magical titles. Text 1, text 2, text 3, etc. The accessibility of this form and all other web content can depend on a variety of factors. But fundamentally, it comes down to how well can people use it. How well can they perceive, with it, perceive it? How well can they interact with it? Screen users obviously need to be able to identify the forms and type into them. People who rely on the keyboard rather than the mouse have got to get into the forms, etc. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm just talking about how we label the forms. Okay, so how do we identify these forms? What sort of results do we get when we test this form with a screen reader? What sort of results might we get when we test it with a few commonly used tools? But first, I'll just do a quick reminder of the web funding guidelines, um, sufficient techniques which are the benchmark for what makes something accessible. We have two sufficient techniques. First one, about labeling forms using the label for attribute and having a matching input ID attribute, or they call them controls, but they're input ID attributes, okay? And the second one there is that when you can't use a, a label, using the type attribute. We have one advisory technique, which is a WAI, WAI ARIA technique, which is saying use describe by to identify a form input. This is just advisory. <coughs> so how does this form perform? How does this form perform? I'm just going to fire up a screen here for a second.
The screen reader I'm going to run is NVDA, um, which is free screen reader made in Australia, and I would very much strongly encourage anybody who never used it to use it. I even doubly encourage people to, to sponsor it because it's free, and any little donation you can make to them is going to help them keep going, and they're really great. They really, they're at the cutting edge of screen reader technology. Task Suite. Labeling form inputs Windows Internet Explorer. Blank. Blank. H.
and so he can hear that crack. Okay, for those of you who have not used tool bar before, you just go up to here, go to the field set and it's just telling me the form, turn it on, and it's telling me a bunch of things about this. The first input field we say is got an associated label, the next one's got no label, it's not saying anything about number three. Fourth one's got an ID, an ID but nothing there. And the fifth one's certainly it's got no label either. If I ask to see the titles, it fills in a blank for number three, which has got a title out of it. So that's the first tool that's really handy to use. How many of you people here have used Wave? Do you know the Wave tool? Yeah? Anybody use the new Wave, the beta, the beta version? The beta version of Wave is very nice. Um, that's just the open page. I won't run it, it's too slow. Well, it's not slow, but I'm not making it But I've already run the page here with the new version of Wave. And one nice thing about this is that um, it can uh, identify stuff down here. We can get some idea of where the errors are and, uh, and stuff like that. Trying to sleep on me, so. Um, so that's the sort of value I can get out of running Wave. Wave provides me another way of looking at it. I'll just see if I can get refresh and speak to that. Too slow. Too Any element, any element can be on to. So if I just put on the label text, 
and it will be a C on the screen there. It's got a uh, text one, and down here we can see it's got a class. It's got a label for one, input one, okay? If I put it over here, where's the steps? Okay. It's also got a name. The name is text one. And you see it's got an ID called is the match that label for out. So what it's done here is just pick up this and put them across. <coughs> it's allowing me to know that. I'll quickly jump down to uh, number three, which has also got a name. Okay? Text three. But in this case here, it's got a little title out here. Okay? So it's picking up. It's, in, it's a different way, it's a different API it's using, but it's picking it up. I'll go to number four. We can see it's got nothing. It's got no title attribute, it's got no existing associated label, so it's got nothing for the screen to associate. The reason why you got it when it was reading is the pre screen would just, if there is nothing there by default, the screen will, will read the words that precedes it. But Mac and GIF uh, track as well as a good thing, of course, but there is no actual API there. The last one is quickly. Also has nothing up here. Because it doesn't have an associated label, if you remember. But, if you look down here, we've got already described by. And it's described by a value of 5. And if we can see down here, already described by 5. And if I go over here, magic thing. We'll see. We've got a matching ID. And so, it's the same idea. It's pulling these together. And that's why, if you notice, when that thing was reading through, that it came in a slightly different order. Um, when it hit that fifth one, it's because it wasn't reading the label, it was reading a different, a different attribute. That's a really quick run through, obviously, what that thing can do. But, strongly recommend that if you've never used a viewer to use it, I would use it every day. It's, it's, it's probably the tool I use the most because it allows me to look inside something and that's real handy. So back to that question, are these all are all these form inputs accessible? Well, certainly you can make sense out of them with a screen reader. Unquestionably you could actually fill this form in with a screen reader without a lot of problem. 